Welcome, everybody. It's Sven Hosford here with another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Today is August 19th. We're a collection of journalists and wellness professionals that like to bring you the latest information about what's going on in the world of lifestyle medicine and integrative medicine in and around Western Pennsylvania and the world. Coming up in this podcast, it's Joni Sturgill. Uh, she'll be here talking about mindful meditation, mindful activities like yoga, and especially what the research is saying about the benefits of these ancient practices on our mental health, our physical health, and our spiritual health. And I'm sure she'll be telling us about a trip to Costa Rica she'll be taking in the spring. Wouldn't you like to go to Costa Rica and do some yoga in March? So coming up in future podcasts, uh, pardon me, we got a cat distraction here. Coming up in future podcasts, we have uh, next week, David Lasondak. Uh, he's a structural integration specialist, and he'll be talking about fascia, your body, and you. What you should know about fascia is really going to be interesting. I promise you that. Uh, in two weeks, I can't wait for this, Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyondananda. He's the co-author of Spontaneous Evolution, and he'll be in Canton, Ohio next month, and he's going to stop by in two weeks to uh, say hello to all the burgers here in town, is as what he says. In three weeks, we're going to be talking about Tai Chi. There's a special visit with Dr. Paul Lamb coming up in September. We will talk about that in the calendar. And in three weeks, uh, Gurney Bolster will be on to talk about Tai Chi. We might have got another special guest with her. And in four weeks, this is, mark your calendars for this, uh, Eric Goldman. He is the managing editor of Holistic Primary Care, which is a print magazine that goes into waiting rooms in dozens of hospitals around the country. And he's got a, a website, and he does a conference called Physician, Heal Thy Practice. Very fascinating uh, project, and can't wait to, uh, to see what he's all about. So before we get to our calendar this week, I had a chance recently to sit down with Dr. Uma Puragala, and this was after she gave a talk about quantum healing out at St. Clair Behavioral Health. And uh, she talked about the latest understandings of quantum physics and the power of thought and intention and how she uses them in her medical practice. And I asked her to expound on some of these points in uh, a short video that we have for you. So let's take a listen and see what she has to say. Uh, your topic this morning was so intriguing and it's so interesting to have a medical doctor who's actually even understands what the term quantum physics means. How, talk a little bit about how you use that, that knowledge of the quantum field in your practice? Well, as I was saying in my talk, my tools have been mo mo mostly mindful meditation mm -hmm. and guided meditation techniques um, and, and some things that you do in yoga that are really hands-on and practical. Um, but it's also the, um, the way I'm conversing with patients more. Um, you know, we have a spiritual side to us and somehow there's this big wall and we're not allowed to be uh, spiritual in a professional setting and all the stuff that's coming out in research tells me no actually I can be spiritual and I can show some evidence to that and so I think it, it's it, there's no specific technique that I use I, I have I feel like I'm a more balanced person I'm happier and if the doctor can be more present and aware and you know, wanting to listen to a patient, then um, you're tapping into a field or an energy that's, you know, powerful and beautiful. And so, um, you know, my group office visits, uh, we do some of those techniques. But. Um, and you talked about like meeting people where they are. And so when you, when, as you do that and you're presenting new ideas very gently sometimes, um, how. How has been the reception from people in general? Uh, that was an interesting evolution because, like mm. I said, my gateway drug was a plant-based diet yeah. that really got my eyes open and hooked on lifestyle medicine. Yeah. And when I first learned about it, I was really eager and trying to push the, you know, it's, it's this way, it's not that way. And I began to realize that, well, actually, that it's both ways sometimes. You know, you know why is George Burns, you know, he died in a hundred with a cigarette in his, you know, <laughs> mouth. Um, and Winston Churchill, I mean, there's all sorts of examples of that. So I, I had to learn 
to understand the the, the person's culture, and um, and then um, you can instantly get their vibes. I mean, there's definitely a feel. And so if I'm talking about plant-based nutrition to somebody who it's just totally abstract or totally stressed, I might use oatmeal as a, hey, use this as a pre-filler food. You know, before breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, have a good old bowl of oatmeal and fruits, and let's not worry too much about the other stuff. When you go out, pre-fill on oatmeal. And people get that, you know, it's, it's a little easier. And then, mm. so you get those vibes and the subtleties in the conversation, um, you know, how no. deep you go with it. Well, you're fairly new to the, the whole plant-based diet thing, right? Uh, I've years? been a vegetarian since I was born, okay. but it, um, it was a traditional Indian vegetarian diet. So, um, and my mom cooked very healthy, but then I, I, I went astray from that, and my diet was cheese and it was oil and it was no vegetables that were, you know, killed but by overcooking type of eating. And so it was not a very healthy plant-based diet. So you could be plant-based but still be really unhealthy. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I think Indians, um, unfortunately, are a good example of that, where yeah. if you look at people who eat Ayurvedically, uh, they're very, most of them are very homeostatic, they're very balanced, but if you look at individuals, you know, eating the tr traditional over-dairy, over, you know, all that stuff, oily, um, we've got uh, the highest diabetes rate hmm. um, in, in pockets of our cities in the world. Wow. We have the highest heart disease rate. I think the statistic is about 20% of Indian men um, will have uh, heart disease, you know, and, and they, that, well, let me get it right. That the men who die get heart disease, uh, a very high percentage of them are get it at age 50, um, or in their 50s in India. But we're we're considered one of the heart disease, diabetes capitals hmm. of the world. Hmm. Now, stress is another big problem with, you know, understanding lifestyle medicine and what to do with it. And you're a big proponent of exercise. Um, and yoga and meditation and mindfulness and those things to help work with stress. How, uh, how are you as a physician, uh, how well does that come across to other physicians? How well are they hearing that and, and understanding that their own example of de-stress practices is so important? Um. I think people are starting to get it. I, I gave a talk to my own group, which is about 37 members, and they received it well. Um, there are some people, some professionals that I think they're stuck because they're so busy and um, probably want to make a transition. Uh, but I think the ice is melting uh, hmm. uh, bit by bit. So That's great. So more and more doctors are realizing that the science is solidly there I think so I'm not I'm not I'm I'm not as brave uh, so the fact that there's so many so much science that is corroborating what I'm saying you know it's I'm kind of jumping on the bandwagon so there's definitely a movement going well on. it may seem like a bandwagon to you but <laughs> you're a big leader in our community so Really appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to us today. Oh, it was my pleasure, and thank I love being here, and thank you for the oh, opportunity. Thank you. So that was Dr. Uma, and she's got an event coming up uh, that you might want to hear about that's coming up in the calendar. Before we get to that, let's take a look backward at last weekend. It was such a gas. The Wellness Meet and Greet put on by Trenton Ozipak and the Organically Social Gang. We had about 35 to 40 wellness businesses and vendors, and uh, we were there as the pop-up podcasters. So let's take a listen to what Trenton had to say. So here we are at the uh, Organically Social Community Wellness Meet and Greet, and this is the meter and greeter, the meatest of the greetest. The meatest of the greetest. <laughs> <laughs> Trent Nazipak with Organically Social. Great event today. Yeah, it's a great turnout. Yeah. Um, it's still early on, so it's only just basically the first sure. hour in. We have like 40 vendors here, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Wow. 30 plus, I've been saying, but it looks like plus. there's 40. Yeah, because it's, it's, there's no space in here. Everything's full. Everything's packed. What kind, of, what kind of vendors you got here? So we have everything from chiropractors to juice bars, yoga studios, fitness studios, Health coaches, I saw kettlebells, kettlebells, yeah. CrossFit gyms, yogurt. There's um, Greek yogurt here. We do. Yeah, nature. You got some really interesting businesses in your network. 
it's, it's very diverse. Cool. Yeah. And so with it, you buy a card, so for people that haven't aren't familiar, you buy a card, and yep. then you get dis deals and discounts on like over fifty different businesses now. Yeah. All related so to now we have models. over fifty businesses within the network. This card is like your all access pass to health and wellness. So you take this card for only twenty four ninety nine, you save at all these businesses within the network, and it's exclusive deals. You're not getting these deals anywhere else. Yeah. Um, Unless you have your card. And you have great events like this you come to. And we you do. And you meet all these people. It's a great, and open great event. Get on down here to the public market today if you're just watching this on social media. I'm Sven Hosford for the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. And, and I'm the meatest of the greatest. <laughs> so to see all the other pop-up videos that we did, be sure to go to our YouTube channel. And you can also listen to a compilation on iTunes. Just do a search for the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. So in the calendar looking ahead... Uh, remember, next Monday is the Alex Hershaft event. Uh, that's going to be at the Rodaf Shalom uh, Congregation. Uh, uh, I think I got that right. Uh, be sure to watch the, the interview we did with Jeffrey Cohen last week. This is going to be a historic event uh, next Monday in Squirrel Hill. On the 12th of September, I really want to make sure you know about this. Tell all your friends. Patty Lemmer has just written the book, Outsmarting Autism. Uh, she just handed me a copy on Saturday. It's amazing, very thick, very detailed index, all the science about autism and autism spectrum disorders. She's hosting the vaccination conversation at Phipps Conservatory on September 12th. It's going to be nine to four. She's got some uh, the country's biggest experts on vaccinations coming in. No hysterics. Uh, no wild science, just real science and a good, calm conversation. Go to eventbrite.com, search for Pittsburgh vaccinations. Coming up on the 13th of September, we're going to have a lot more about this. This is going to be very exciting. What's on your plate? This is a wellness event at RMU. It's on Saturday from 11 to 3. Can't wait to uh, get out there. We'll be inviting the meetup group of integrative medicine professionals. So be sure, uh, if you're not already, be sure to join that if you are a professional and you'll get notice about that. We'll also be sending out a notice for the 19th of September for St. Clair's annual end of summer social. They call it a celebration of success. It's Friday night, the 19th of September. Uh, we'll have a campfire, music, drumming, uh, good food, sharing. Uh, it's good company. Visit sayclair.com for more details. That's S-E-C-L-A-I-R-E-R. -E uh, and the good folks out there, uh, lots of good things happening out at St. Clair. And on the 25th, uh, Dr. Ramirez del Toro is going to be hosting a world leader in Tai Chi by the name of Dr. Paul Lam. He is the founder and director of the internationally resound Tai Chi for Health Institute. Uh, one of the graduates of that program is Gurney Bolster, and she's going to be, I'm sure she's the one that put this all together, and she's going to be joining us uh, coming up in a podcast in a few weeks, as we said. Also coming up on the 27th of September in Canton, Ohio, the 27th and 28th, our good buddy Swami Biandananda, a.k.a. Steve Behrman, will be uh, doing a, a Friday evening and then a Saturday workshop, uh, cosmic comedy on Friday night, and then an interactive play shop on Saturday. Uh, mergingheartsorg slash swami.html will get you all the details you need to know about that event. Now, we just heard from Dr. Uma, and you can meet her in person for just $10. She and Dr. Kim Hewitt and Kim Pierce, RD, uh, will be doing a lifestyle seminar at St. Clair Hospital in the Dunlop Auditorium, 7 to 9 p.m. That's October 1st. It'll be on mindful meditation, mindful exercising, and mindful plant-based eating. Uh, vegan food sampling. 10 bucks. It's 412-835-6653 uh, uh, to get your place in that. Don't forget, too, that the uh, November 2nd through the 4th, Pittsburgh School of Massage has the big CE conference out at Seven Springs. Uh, we will be getting one of those instructors on. You get more details about that uh, at pghschmass.com. And uh, also, we all like to remind you about Dan Wagner's rainforest trip uh, going down to Ecuador November 9th to the 19th. Go to NutriPharmacy.com or StudentRainforestFund.org for more details about that. So that's the calendar for this week. So now let's get to our guest. Joni Sturgill uh, teaches mindfulness, meditation, yoga, and all-around balance and good health. 
She uh, is also planning a trip to Costa Rica, which I'm sure we'll talk a lot about. Uh, welcome, Joni Sturgill. Hi, Sven. Thank you. So let's start with a couple of the basics for people that may not be uh, as tuned in. Um, what exactly, when we talk about mindfulness, what exactly is that's real big in the news? It's on the cover of Time and everything. What exactly does that mean? So the way that I look at mindfulness, there's two components to it. You can practice mindfulness as a meditation technique in which you really are focusing on the present moment and you're trying to get out of your head. So you're letting go of those thoughts, worrying, anxiety about the future. You're letting go of uh, things that have happened in the past. You're really just remaining present. So that's a meditation technique. We can also practice mindfulness in anything that we're doing. It just involves really paying close attention to your body, reactions that you're having, um, your mental state, your emotions, and just kind of noticing things as they arise, particularly noticing them with what we call non-judgmental awareness. So it's about letting go of all the self-criticism that we're so good at. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, they teach that uh, a special course in that in elementary school, I think, in American schools. So. <laughs> well, that's definitely something I think we should be teaching our children. And I know from the time my boys were very young, I volunteered to go in and teach little bits of yoga, little bits mm -hmm. of mindfulness and meditation to kids because, my gosh, if we could teach um, our youth this, especially oh, wow. in the digital age and especially with all the distractions that are available, I, I think it's really going to become necessary um, as, as this next generation grows up in, in the digital age and in the technical age. Absolutely. Well, I know, uh, you know, people around my age were really the first generation to grow up with TV. Uh, I mean, I could remember being very young and seeing a test pattern as what Channel 4 was broadcasting during the day. You know, there was no more none of the 24 hour stuff. So mm -hmm. uh, and I know how challenging it is. Um, I, I think it's kind of rewired our our nervous system entirely, uh, all the digital distractions. Uh, can we talk a little bit more about that? I think uh, you were absolutely right. As the, as the newer, newer generations come in, they're, they're already so wired in one way. that How do we unwire them? Well, that's, that's a really good point, and that's what a lot of the current research is studying with meditation, okay. is not just, you know, so we know from the last few thousand years that people have been practicing meditation, you know, there's testimonials and there, people can say, oh, well, this reduces stress, it makes you feel better, but science is now starting to back the practice of meditation and the practice of mindfulness, and as they study it, they're realizing that the practice of meditation really changes the brain and how the brain functions. When we're under stress, um, we have high levels of cortisol, stress hormone in the body. And when the brain is bathed in cortisol, essentially you lose the ability to recall information. You can lose um, hmm. certain aspects of memory and you also make learning a lot more challenging. So we need to reduce those cortisol levels and meditation is one thing that does that. Also, the other things that they're um, learning, what meditation does to the brain of long-term meditators, is you have a thicker prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. The prefrontal cortex is our executive functioning. It, what, it's what helps us to make good decisions. Um, it's what helps us to guide us on our path through life. Um, and it also helps to regulate emotions. So in talking about the brain, emotions are in um, are processed in the amygdala. So I always use kind of a little visual. So if I, if I can do this, if, if my sure. hand were the brain and um, my thumb would be the amygdala, okay, the amygdala is in the center of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, what I'm saying is really strong in meditators, um, wraps around the amygdala so that when you're having a stress reaction, the prefrontal cortex is there to help us make decisions, help us make good decisions, even when we're having an emotional reaction. But when we're under stress, what often happens is that prefrontal cortex freaks out. It flips up mm. and we're just all emotion. We're just a big ball of emotion. And this is where you have people who um, have chronic anxiety, 
people who have anger issues, it's because their prefrontal cortex disengages and the practice of meditation really helps to settle that back down. And it helps to teach us that it's okay. Hmm. Um, I know from my own personal experience with sleep apnea that, uh, when you don't sleep very well, one of the first things that goes is your executive function. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, besides uh, relearning how to sleep, I've uh, really leaned on meditation as a way to kind of come back to balance and wholeness. So I, I love your, your explanation there. That makes so much sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I frequently tell people, uh, so meditation it, it, it can, the body can really rest and the mind can really rest in certain states of meditation, but mm -hmm. also different parts of the mind are really activated when we meditate. Um, but it's interesting you bring up sleep because I was just teaching a group last night and someone was saying that they had insomnia and I was actually saying there are some techniques that I teach as meditation techniques, but I would also suggest you use them as a way to help you sleep. But they're not the same. It depends on what your intention is. Right, right. Yeah, well, that, that's going to bring us to yoga um, and um, how that kind of works hand in hand. Uh, from my understanding and, and my you know, training with yoga um, at the Himalayan Institute, they, the basic idea is that all of the asanas, the physical postures, are really just a way to calm down the body to prepare you for meditation. Is that basically Absolutely. how you understand it? Absolutely. So um, the physical postures of yoga are meant to prepare the body for meditation. And that is, it's interesting in this country, in the West, we've taken yoga as just a physical practice sometimes. And it's a pretty and darn good one too. Yeah. Absolutely. It yeah. is a great physical practice because it really helps you to find balance um, in strength and flexibility. Uh, it can be a very mindful practice because you're really having to pay attention to your breath and your body. But the intent historically for the physical practice of yoga was to make the body strong enough and flexible enough, and particularly the spine strong enough and flexible enough so that you can sit in meditation for long periods and it's interesting in the west that we kind of leave the meditation part out sometimes at least in a lot of yoga classes right. it's left out well and it's actually designed to calm down the nervous system yeah so that you yes. can sit with all of that cortisol blast and open your prefrontal cortex and all you just described absolutely yeah so um we're going to get more into the science um, after we talk about the kind of where you got your training and everything. But one of the things I notice about uh, this industry and the people that do coaching and uh, a lot of integrated medicine professionals is they've they've come to their practice through their own personal health crises uh, in almost every instance that you see this. Once in a while, you see it was a family member. I only know one person whose best friend. I uh, got breast cancer, and then that turned her life around, and she changed careers. Tell us how you got into what you do and where you came from and uh, why you believe what you believe. Well, um, this whole, uh, so whenever I work with people, I really work with people in a holistic way, and so that means looking at their diet, looking what they eat, but the primary thing that I've found that we all need is stress reduction and, and meditation, and I came about that by, um, so about 14 years ago or so, I was in my mid-20s, and um, I uh, was a very stressed out type A. I was a very angry young woman, and I wasn't, I wasn't happy. And somebody suggested that I go to a yoga class, said, Joni, you need to learn to relax. Like a chill pill, right? <laughs> and, so I, uh, and so I went. And it, it totally changed my life. And the one brief story that I frequently share with people is um, as kind of a, a snapshot of what meditation has done for me personally is um, uh, when I was a young woman, I, when I was driving in my car, I would have road rage and I would you know, squeeze the steering wheel and I felt like red kind of going up and like a cartoon character, you know, I would fill with red and steam would shoot out my ears <laughs> and I would be so upset when I would drive the car. 
And I wasn't even really aware that I was like that. I didn't have that self-awareness. And with the practices of yoga and meditation, I started to realize, wow, I really freak out when I'm in the car and not just in the car, but in other places in my life. Like, how can I change that? So again, to give you that snapshot, I started practicing meditation every morning, but I would also practice it in my car. I would do all these mindful exercises, all this deep breathing. And every time I would get in the car, I'd have to talk myself off that ledge of freaking out and having this big reaction. And then one day, probably a year or two after I started the practice, I was driving my car and there was tons of traffic. I was late to where I was going. It was the perfect trigger situation. And a big light bulb goes off over my head and I realize I'm not stressed. Hmm. I felt my body felt relaxed. I wasn't having that reaction anymore. It's like I reprogrammed myself to not have a reaction in that situation. And once I started to see that this was happening in other aspects of my life too, that I could handle stress and I could handle kind of the speed bumps of life with a lot more ease and grace because of these practices, mm -hmm. it felt so profound to me. And so I started to seek out ways to study it further. And um, I've studied with, I've studied meditation with um, Pema Chodron, um, Max Strom, um, uh, a lot of different teachers at Kripalu Center for Yoga in Massachusetts. Uh, my teacher that I had here in Pittsburgh that I got my first training from was Joanne Vandenhangel. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, Joanne. And um, so all those people have influenced me tremendously, and I've had a number of teachers throughout the years. Um, but it's, uh, it's, I really feel it's that personal experience that made it resonate so much that made me want to share it with others because I know there are so many people out there who are as stressed out as I was. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's interesting, you know, you, you talk about um, mindfulness becoming aware and being able to observe your thoughts. Did you ever figure out what you were so angry about when you were in your 20s? Or was it was just anger. Um, I think it was just, uh, well, I was in my 20s, so I think it was immaturity, yeah. <laughs> some of it. <laughs> and it could be sugar, too. Let's say, but you know. I, I, I think it was, um, I don't know, I think it was a combination of things. I mean, I think that we get stressed out, all of us get stressed out and have reactions when life is not as we think it should be right? We think everything is supposed to go our way and we have a certain picture of what life is supposed to be and how the future is supposed to unfold. The future being, you know, five minutes from now and two years from now. And if things don't work out the way we envisioned, I think we kind of almost sometimes have adult versions of temper tantrums, you know, Not and um, the practice yeah. of meditation uh, and mindfulness in particular, uh, for me, and I know for a lot of my students, has helped them accept whatever is present in, in front of you. You know, often we can't change our circumstances. We can only change how we react and respond to our circumstances. So instead of um, moving toward any situation from a place of resentment or anger or frustration, um, we ultimately do have a choice that with the practice of mindfulness and meditation, we can bring ourselves into a place of more calm equanimity and to approach any situation with that, um, I think is much better than, than the alternative, which is just reacting kind of mindlessly. Mm -hmm. I think once you get used to using the tools, at some point there, there comes a, a little light switch moment when you realize that, you know, you talked about how your body responded to stress when you're angry and, and your body was so tense and then when you realize your body wasn't tense and that tense or not tense is not caused by the external circumstances by the choice but by the choice you make as to whether you're going to get angry or not how you're going to respond to it like you said right right exactly it's it's about uh, it's really about our thoughts and how we think about any given circumstance. And sometimes it's hard to see another perspective, um, but if we can step back and settle our emotions enough to see another perspective, that can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. One thing that um, 
when I did a training with Pema Chodron several years ago, um, she guided us as a way of working through challenging emotions, emotions like grief, emotions like anger. Um, she talked, she gave a great illustration and kind of metaphor for strong emotions that when any of us are experiencing a strong emotion, it can feel like we're standing in rapids, okay, like a fast moving river. And the emotion is a wave smacking us in the face again and again, sometimes to the point that we feel like we're drowning in it. And to try to function from this place is, is rather pointless. You're, you're not going to be able to function. And so what meditation can do for us is it can help us step out of the rapids and step onto the riverbank. And there we can honor the emotion that we're experiencing. We can look at it and we can say, wow, I'm really angry right now. But we can choose from a more centered place, what should I do with this emotion? How should I respond to this emotion? Mm -hmm. How can I get through this? As opposed to drowning, where it feels like you don't have a choice when you're drowning. Well, all of these tools that you've uh, acquired and all this great training you've had, you've got uh, two kind of interesting situations, I think, in your life where it's uh, probably very helpful. The first is as a parent. You've got two, uh, two young sons. They've got to keep you pretty busy on top of everything else you do. Tell us how these tools help you as a parent. These tools are essential to parenting. I I really love teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I I love teaching parents because um, it's uh, I mean it's it's an essential practice and well, they it's need something it the most, that really, right? I I missed that. Well, what did I you said say? They, they need it the most. Yes, absolutely. Because being a parent requires tremendous patience. <laughs> and um, so another, I always like to give little brief stories as an illustration. And I can think of a time a few years ago when my boys were a little bit younger. And I was, it's a specific moment in time. And I was making dinner and I was rushing because we had to go somewhere that evening. And I was trying to respond to clients client emails while I was making dinner and my boys started to wrestle and fight in the other room. And normally I let them go unless I hear anger, <laughs> like I let them wrestle. <laughs> um, and I Good started thing. to hear just the beginnings of that. And with all the stress of making dinner and knowing the deadline and trying to respond to email, I felt myself starting to get agitated. And before it escalated to the point that I felt myself about ready to like scream at my children and basically take out all of my frustration on them. And I stopped myself before I got to that point. And I just, I'm, so I was rushing around the kitchen and I just stopped and I stood really still and I visualized myself as a tree. Like I grounded, rooted myself in that moment, felt like my feet were sinking down into the floor and I just did long, slow, deep breaths just for like a minute. And it took my stress level from through the roof to down into the ground again so that then I could respond and realize I can only do what I can do. If something doesn't get done or, you know, whatever, you just have to let things go. Mm -hmm. The happy side effect in that little story was... Um, when I stood really still and I was just breathing in the kitchen, my boys stopped fighting. And I remember they looked over at me and one of them whispered, what's wrong with her? <laughs> <laughs> Mom's freaking out. <laughs> oh, that's really funny. <laughs> so the other, the other, uh, thing on your plate that you do, which I think is really interesting, where these tools are probably pretty helpful, is uh, corporate training and going into uh, the uh, office workplace and doing yoga and stress management there. Tell us, tell us about some of those experiences. So those experiences are some of my favorite because working in the corporate world, I often encounter people who are very skeptical of the tools that I have to offer. And I love to work with people who are skeptical because 99% of the time I'm able to convince them to see the value in it. And um, so I love going into the office also in the middle of the workday into offices and helping people 
just find a little bit of calmness or just, again, ratchet down that stress level that, you know, as soon as they walk into class, I look at their faces and I can tell that they're stressed out and they're anxious and they're worried and they're overloaded and they're overworked. And when they leave, they look so much lighter. So it's, it's some of my most fulfilling work is working with people in, in the corporate field. You try that tree technique with them and, and get them to root? I absolutely, absolutely. I say it in a little bit of a different way, <laughs> but I, I do have them do the same thing. Um, and, you know, different visualizations and descriptives work for different people. So, <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so where, uh, where do you teach an area that uh, the average uh, non-corporate person can come in and take some of your classes? So um, right now, public classes that I offer um, are primarily at schoolhouse yoga, at all the different schoolhouse yoga locations. I'm also teaching at a new place um, in the Wexford area, which is close to my home, um, called the Brain Health Center. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Brian Nussbaum. Yes, um, Paul Nussbaum. Paul Nussbaum, sorry. Yeah, yes. Brian Brain. I got that mixed up there. <laughs> and I actually just came from there um, shortly before, uh, you know, speaking with you now uh, and, and taught a meditation session on acute stress there. So um, so those are the two places right now, primarily uh, the public spaces that I teach. I work with people privately a lot, again, in several corporations around the Pittsburgh area. Um and you've got a, uh, a little class coming up uh, that's not exactly in Pittsburgh, but uh, a little more tropical location. You want to tell us about that? That's right. So a few years ago, I attended a yoga and meditation retreat in Costa Rica, and I found Costa Rica to be such a beautiful country, and the people are so kind, and... Uh, the setting, you just couldn't ask for a more beautiful setting. And so this year I found a place that I could host my own retreat in Costa Rica. So um, the date for the retreat is um, March 7th through 14th of 2015. Uh, which will be here before we know it, you know, <laughs> I mean, we're almost in September now, so March will be here. Um, but yeah, so it's a mindfulness yoga um, retreat. And I have several people coming who don't have very much experience with meditation or yoga. So I, I love working with beginners, people who are brand new. So whether you're brand new to yoga and meditation, uh, or whether you're experienced um, it'll be a great time to refresh and renew and just get away and relax. And while we will have um, several meditation and yoga sessions and some discussion periods and uh, even some journaling exercises and other things that I'm gathering from my graduate work in psychology, we'll have a lot of positive things from that that we'll be working on in Costa Rica. There will also be plenty of time for just relaxing hanging out, doing excursions, you know, horseback riding on the beach, zip lining, trekking to a waterfall in the jungle. <laughs> okay, I'm there. Um, <laughs> what's, uh, what's the website for uh, more information about that? The website is, um, I have to look at it for a second, make sure I get it right, is truenatureeducation.com. Okay. True Nature Education, and you can find that via my website to uh, healthybodypeacefulsoul.com. Um, on my front page, if you scroll down, I have a little bit of information about the retreat and, uh, and that, that website that you need to go to to register for it. Awesome. So we're coming up on the time here. Is there anything on this topic uh, you think that's really important that we didn't cover? <clears throat> I think we covered a lot. I, I think it's, um, and it, like we covered briefly in the beginning, I think it's so important, the concept of getting mindfulness and getting meditation in some form in our schools, you know, to help kids uh, starting off. Um, but it's a practice that absolutely everyone can benefit from. And I know we didn't go into a lot, but uh, on the nutritional side of things, you know, you can do all these things, but if you're still drinking a gallon of Mountain Dew a day, 
you know, it's not going to be as effective, right? So it's good. Ab- absolutely. It's, it's so important to have balance in your life overall. And how I teach wellness and nutrition in particular, you know, we don't have to deprive ourselves entirely. It's really what we consume most of the time, what we consume 80, 85% of the time that has an effect on our health. So, you know, that doesn't mean you have to forever avoid pizza or whatever your you know, ice cream, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you can have a treat occasionally, just as long as the bulk of your diet is really clean and really healthy. Right. Well, I really appreciate you being here with us today. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. And uh, we're going to say our goodbyes here. So that will do it for this week. Join us again next week for the next edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. That will be David Lasondak talking about fascia. And you can look for us on Facebook, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, and YouTube. Or you can watch it live every Tuesday at 4 o'clock right here on journaloflifestylemedicine.com. Also look for our Integrated Medicine Professionals group on Meetup. So if you're a professional. So until next time, yins, be careful out there.